We are going to be in the book of Acts. Chapter 16, learning about Lydia. Each and every week we have had such an amazing opportunity to glean and identify with these beautiful wildflowers of the Bible. Each one is unique in itself, beautiful and set apart like each and every one of us are in Christ. Our unique significance comes from the master creator, from God alone. And regardless of how prickly we might be or how pliable we might be, God created us this way for a reason and for a purpose. It is our responsibility to use these gifts talents, and even our personalities to fulfill that purpose. Today, as we consider the life of Lydia, I want you to just take a moment to turn internally and take a look at your life. Reflect on your life. Take a moment to think about and identify the season of life that you are going through right now. Now think about what God wants to do in and through this season. Whether you are young or old, single, married, divorced, or widowed, a new believer or a seasoned believer, every season in our lives, every stage of life, God has a specific reason and purpose for you. Lydia the Aster is a woman that many would have or may have counted out. Lydia was a woman who her faith bloomed later in life, but not one without significance and purpose. And maybe you sit here today and you feel like it's a little too late for you. Maybe it's too late for you to make a difference. You feel like, well, I've kind of lived a life of consequence and now I'm too broken for God to use me. Maybe you're someone who is a little bit older now and you feel like you spent and wasted your youth on chasing the things of the world. Maybe you feel like the years God had for you that he wanted to use are before or behind you and not before you. If you can identify with that, I ask you to consider the aster flower. The aster flower is the star of the autumn garden, making them the great late bloomers. Some call them the heroes of the fall because they are the flower, when every other flower is fading away, they take center stage and they have a beautiful bloom. They are a hardy plant that grows one to six feet tall and one to four feet wide, forming a bush rather than a single flower. Their name comes from an ancient Greek word that means star, referring to the shape of the flower head. And much like the flower, we are going to see how Lydia, despite her late conversion to Christianity, very much served as a star, a star like the Star of David in her community, pointing others to Christ. Lydia's faith ran deep and quickly spread widely throughout her place of influence under the leadership and teachings of Paul. And I want to pause for a minute and just acknowledge one of the things that I have loved about this study and one of the things that I love to acknowledge is the fact that this study highlights how Paul empowered women to be doers of the faith. He discipled and empowered them, and so we do have a voice, and we do have a place in the ministry. Last week, we met Yodia. Is that right? Yodia. Yodia. Sorry, I'm going to butcher every name. That's just how we roll here. Yodia and Sintika. They were the thistles of the wildflowers who labored in the gospel alongside Paul. Now, we meet a woman who was converted in fact, the first conversion in the European area under the teachings of Paul, who made a great impact in her family and in her home and in her community. We tend to believe that women don't play very much significance in spreading the gospel, that they play little to none, but that is far from the truth. We see time and time again, God enable, equip, and use women to bring the good news to, of Jesus Christ to their communities and areas of influence. 
Ladies, we have been given a mouthpiece, a microphone, a platform, a level of influence that we can use to point others to Christ. A good question or even maybe a challenge for you this evening is what are you doing with your level of influence in your home, in your workplace, in your group of friends? How are you utilizing or maybe underutilizing the power of influence that God has given you? Have you allowed your stage of life or maybe even the circumstances that you're currently going through deter you from being an aster, a star that points others to Jesus? If so, it's not too late. It's not too late to be used by God. It's not too late for you to make a difference. Lydia's life is a perfect example of this. Let's take this opportunity to glean and learn from the exemplary life that she lived so that we might be more like her. Today we're going to see that Lydia was a hope-seeking woman. She was a hard-working woman and a hospitable woman. So a little backstory here. In Acts 15, we find Paul and Silas on their second missionary journey. And their goal was to go back and visit the brethren so that every uh, city that they had previously visited, they were going back and returning to see how the brethren or the, the church was doing, to check on them and to encourage them. Then quickly after that, Timothy joins them, and that's where we're going to pick up in Acts 16, verse 6. It says, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Messiah, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Messiah, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Let's pause here. Paul is on a journey going back through previous cities he has visited, visiting believers that he believes needs encouragement and needs further teaching of the gospel. Along the way, God continues to shut doors on him, shutting doors to entering a city and preach the word. Did you catch that? God said no. He said no to something that seems like a good thing to be pursuing, right? He's trying to pursue furthering the gospel. He's trying to encourage the brethren, but the Holy Spirit forbids him from sharing and preaching the word. How many of you have experienced this in your life? Maybe a time you thought you were pursuing God's will, pursuing a good thing, and yet God shuts the door on you or tells you no. Did you, how did you respond? Did you respond by giving up? Did you resist the, and continue in that pursuit anyways? What did you do when you felt like the Lord had shut a door on you? I know in my life I haven't always responded correctly to God and his redirecting. As a young mom, I wanted babies upon babies upon babies. Okay, I'm a girl who had a mis... I guess, promiscuous past to some level. And now I'm going, okay, Lord, this is when it's a good thing. It's a within marriage, the confines of our home. I want babies. Your, your word says we should um, multiply. And so I'm just trying to do that. Heed your word, right? But he said no. And so for a long time, I was frustrated and even bitter. I was frustrated with my husband who was like, hey, one girl, one boy. Could it get much better? I'm like, mm-hmm, two and two, <laughs> you know? And trying to understand and grasp, Lord, you say if I do your will and pursue your will for my life that you will give the things that my heart desires. My heart desires this. There's nothing here that tells me that it's not a good thing. 
Your word doesn't say it's not a good thing. And so it caused friction in my marriage because I was hung up on what I felt like the Lord was withholding from me, a blessing that I felt like, I deserve this. I'm following you. I'm bringing my children up in the Lord. Why can't I have this? And the long and short of it is a good thing is not always the right thing. And the Lord had to show me that. We did pursue having more children, but the Lord said, no, Janae, you're not going to have more babies, and that's okay. Do I have a fulfilled plan now of going, oh, yes, so God said no more babies, and then this miraculous thing happened, and we're doing this and that, and God answered and opened all the doors. No. The Lord shut the door. It's my job now not to sit there and go, come on, I'm knocking, hello, I'm waiting. It's for me to pivot and go, okay, Lord, what do you have for me? Okay, so to walk on, that is exactly what Paul did. He simply pivoted. He felt like he was doing the right thing. God said no, and he pivoted. When God shuts the door, we need to pivot and open and wait for him to open another door. It says in Acts 16 that after Paul sees the vision that the call to Macedonia, he immediately sought to go there. So he kept walking forward. He got a no, so he pivoted. He kept going. He got another no. He pivoted again. He kept going. He kept pursuing the Lord and the work of the Lord. And then the Lord, what did he do? He swung open a door, a wide open door, giving him direction and vision of where he was to go next. For Paul, God's no's were just as important as God's goes. Ladies, we need to allow God to control the stops and starts of our lives. We need to yield to the Holy Spirit knowing that his plans for our lives are far, far greater than we could ever dream up for ourselves. God has a specific reason for putting roadblocks in our lives, and we need to trust him even when they don't make sense and believe that his way is a better way. Okay, so we see here Paul, Silas, and Timothy respond to this call to a man in a vision, or in their vision, in Paul's vision. And in fact, we believe this man who called was actually a woman. We believe it was Lydia. Pick up with me in verse 11. It says, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Sumatres, trying, and the next day came to Naples. From there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And when we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went out to of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and we spoke to the women who met us there. Why was it customary for prayer to take place next to the riverbank? The region of Macedonia is believed to be a melting pot of nations and cultures. Archaeologists suggest that it was a metropolitan city And they believed this because the writings on the monuments were found and the inscriptions were inscribed in many different languages. It is said that Apollos, the sun god, was the main god worshipped in this region. However, we meet a group of Jewish women by the river worshipping Jehovah, the god of the Jews. This is because in order for there to be a synagogue in the land, you needed 10 capable Jewish men to run it. So this kind of paints a story for you. You're realizing she's in a very secular world. She's surrounded by the world. She doesn't have many fellow believers that she could lean on. But instead of worshiping in a temple, we find her worshiping by the riverside. The first thing we learn about Lydia is that she was a hope-seeking woman. In verse 13, we see that Lydia went to the riverbank with a group of women to worship. Interestingly, 
Lydia is a Phoenician name derived from the Greek language, meaning Lydia was most likely not a Jewish woman, but most likely a proselyte, or Jewish by faith, but not creed. Why is that important? For me, it, it shows me of, and affirms me of a few different things that are noteworthy. And one is that God has created a God-shaped hole in every man and every woman's heart that only he can fill. The Amplif or Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. I'm going to read that from the Amplified Version of the Bible. It says, He has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. Lydia, like many of us, has encountered a number of different religions. We are told that during this time period, the majority of the population was worshiping Apollo. Yet we find Lydia worshiping God. Maybe you are just now realizing that your dissatisfaction is not coming from the Lord or those around you, but coming from the things that you try to fit in to that God-sized hole in your heart. Maybe you are just now realizing the lacking that you have, that it can't be filled by anything but God. 1 John 2, 15, 17 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it but he who does the will of God abides forever. The truth is there is nothing on this earth that can satisfy you. There is no quick fix, no temporary band-aid that you can put over your festering wound. It might feel better for a little bit. It might look better or maybe out of sight, out of mind, but in the end, your need will be even greater. Ladies, if you have family friends, co-workers, neighbors, anyone in your life that you know doesn't know God, I would start praying for those God-sized holes in their lives. We all have it. We all search to fill it, but there is only one who can satisfy, and we need to let them know what that is. C.S. Lewis thoughtfully wrote, If we find ourselves with the desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest or hint at the real thing. God set eternity in our hearts because he wants us to long for the real thing. We need to long after him. The second thing this assures me of through the life of Lydia is that if we seek to know God, we will find him. Matthew 7, 7 through 8 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Psalms 9, 10. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Psalms 119.2, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. Ladies, Lydia sought the Lord and she found him. It was a divine appointment that he orchestrated and there was a God-sized hole in her life, but she still had to choose to seek out the resolve. She had to seek out the Lord, and that is why the Lord led her to the riverside. He led her there so that he could meet her there. He provided somebody who could uh, teach her and baptize her and show her what, 
being a follower of Jesus was all about. At the riverbank, Lydia met the living God. We read this in verse 14 and 15. It says, Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Tyre, Ty. Say it again. Thyra, Tyra. It sounds like a name of a girl, like with sass. Thyra, Tyra. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Who worshiped God? The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Here we see the first Christian convert in the European area. First Lydia, and then her household. What an amazing testimony Lydia has just right in those few verses. That her, the outpouring of her faith began a ripple effect in her home and in her community. This outpouring of faith is evident in Lydia's actively getting involved in ministry. Upon her conversion, we see her immediately try to open her doors and encourage Paul and the others to come in, to come and stay with her. Can that be said about you? Are you someone who comes to church to serve or to be served? To find something that you're longing for, yes, but we're also called to care for one another and to serve one another. If you are not actively involved in serving in the body of Christ, I urge you that that be your next step in your faith. Maybe that's plugging in to sheology and seeing where they need help in the women's ministry. Maybe that's serving alongside some others in the children's ministry. Maybe that is literally opening up your home as a host or a leader of a connect group. We're gonna take a closer look at how Lydia was hospitable, but first I wanna take a look at how she was a hardworking woman. We see in 14 that Lydia was the seller of purple, the city of Thyatira. You got it. Yes, <laughs> winning. <laughs> it probably won't come out right the next time. The city of Thyatira is the city that Lydia was hailed from. So it means she was raised there and then she moved to Philippi. It was well known for its artist skills and one of these included dyers. The water in this region was famous for dyeing and it had, its unique color of purple was produced and well known renown around the world. So Lydia sold purple, which is perfectly showcases our aster. Aster is a flower that comes in a variety of purples, such as lavender to a deep violet. Purple was the most precious and costly color of ancient dyes. It was derived from a shellfish found in the Mediterranean Sea, kind of like a snail uh, and a mollusk. And it is said that it would take over 250,000 of these mollusks to make one ounce of dye. So you can imagine how incredibly expensive it was to have cloth drenched in this royal color. As a seller of purple, Lydia was likely a wealthy, artistic, and keen businesswoman. We see in verse 15 that she was the head of her household. This implies that she was either single or she was widowed. She was an independent woman who had a great reputation because of her prosperous business. No doubt she had a spacious home, many employees working at the mill, several servants to attend to her daily personal needs, and all of that which she utilized to serve the church. For those who, of you who are in a similar uh, stage of life or similar season of life, you are single, divorced, or even widowed, I pray that Lydia's example and her life is encouraging to you and gives you the, what's the word? gives you the value, but also the capability of stepping out and not being dependent on something else or someone else. And I don't mean to like 
push down on men. I love my husband, and I am so glad and thankful to be under his leadership. But ladies, you do not need a man to get a job done. Okay? So know that you have value. Know you, that you are capable. And that God is ready and willing to use you as an independent woman if you allow him to. Women back then did not have equal rights or equal opportunities, not like we have today. In a culture that was male-dominated, Lydia could have easily been deterred from pursuing her career, career or pursuing her faith. But she did not seek out marriage as a fix-it. Instead, she used her gifts and talents to become a successful businesswoman. Lydia did not let her singleness hold her back from her successes or from being a vessel used by God. It was quite the opposite. She used the influence she gained in the community through her fine workmanship to be the platform on which she used to share the gospel. And for all of us working women or those working moms out there, I pray that this encourages you knowing that the women in the Bible did have jobs. They did have a career, okay? And that should encourage us knowing, I know sometimes as a mom, I've been, I've felt like, okay, so now your first ministry, ministry is your family. You need to serve your children. And absolutely that is the truth, but it doesn't mean that I can't have a job. It doesn't mean that I can't use the gifts and talents God has given me to bless others and glorify him. And so that is exactly what Lydia does. She uses the gifts and talents that God has given her to glorify God. And I find in my life that I find great purpose from working. It gives me and creates discipline, a routine, and again, it helps me find purpose and fulfillment through using what God has given me that I might use it to bless somebody else or help somebody else for the glory of God. In regard to Lydia's work and work ethic, Herbert Locklear, a famous minister and author, wrote, when Paul penned the triple ex exhortation, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, which is in Romans 12, 11, we do not know whether he had his hospitable convert Lydia in mind. She certainly exemplified these three virtues, and grace can be ours to emulate them. Does that not inspire you? Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. The Lord completely blessed Lydia and her business ventures as she sought to glorify him through it. Ladies, we need to be intentional like this. If our businesses are God-honoring and what we do, we work at diligently, we can be confident that God will honor us. 1 Samuel 2.30 says, Those who honor me, I will honor. If we are fervent in spirit, if we are zealous for the Lord, if we have a glow about us, we can be confident that our day-to-day -day work and responsibilities will still point others to God. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light shine, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And like Lydia, we can choose not just to work, but to work unto the Lord and serve others and be confident that he will bless us in that. Lydia was able to use the abundance that the Lord had given her to pour out and help others. We see this multiple times. In verse 15, we saw her beg Paul, Silas, and Timothy to come and stay with her and her household. And now we will see her as she opens up her doors again to the brethren in verse 40. This is where we will see that Lydia was a hospitable woman. So as time passes by, Paul continues to preach the gospel in Philippi, in the Philippi area, their surrounding areas, and it starts taking root. There are converts. They see people added to the church on a daily basis. 
But this also brings about bad, negative attention and ultimately lands Paul and Silas in jail. Uh, Acts 16, 25 through 26 says, But at midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains, chains were loosed. So we see that even in the midst of persecution and these trials, that Paul and Silas are choosing to praise and worship the Lord anyways. And as they call out to Lord, the Lord, the Lord responds and loosens their chains. We'll pick up in verse 40, and that's when we see, so they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. I think it's safe to say that the first church was most likely started in Lydia's home. What an amazing testament that is. Again, we see that Lydia is using all that she was blessed with to give back to the Lord. She lived a life of open hands. And it's evident that she was eager to serve the missionaries because of the heart that God had given her with open hands, that choice that she made to live with an open palm. And I think she was intentional about that. What if we were intentional about the same thing, if we could actually and honestly recognize that everything that we have was given to us from God. After acknowledging that, being able and willing to open your palm, saying, above my desires, above my needs, why don't I give and help someone who has a greater need than me? Ladies, as the world grows in hatred towards Christianity and towards Christians, we can only assume that the level of persecution we experience will increase in quantity and severity. Lydia's transformed life was evident through her eagerness to serve the missionaries through hospitality. Not only did she open her doors when it felt like everything was safe, but again, she opened her doors after witnessing her brethren go through severe persecution. They were beaten and whipped and then stuck in a prison cell. She could have easily saw them coming and said, mm, I love you guys, but I can't. Think about the pressure that Peter felt. He was in a similar situation. Jesus was taken from him, and right there he was ready to combat. And then as they come and they question him, oh, I don't know that man. Yeah. So she could have easily turned her back and walked away or shut her doors. But despite that, despite the, what she witnessed in the persecution, she still opened her doors to two fugitives. Ladies, we know that the persecution is only coming and we know that the devil is knocking on our doors and he's throwing everything at us. We need to make sure that we don't let the devil deter us from doing good, deter us from being generous and hospitable to others and one another despite the persecutions we might face. May we be like Lydia and heed the Lord and his word when he commands and encourages us to be generous and hospitable. Romans 12, 13 says, Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Hebrews 13, 2, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. I pray that happens to me. <laughs> First Peter 4, 9, offer hospitality one to another without grumbling. God loves a cheerful giver, whether that is opening your home or giving to the church or giving to a charity. He loves it when you give cheerfully. Proverbs 11, 24 through 25, one gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will, him, in, will himself be watered. And in Acts 20, 35, 
Paul tells us to remember the words of the Lord himself. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. It is clear to me that this is how Lydia lived her life. It is evident to me with her character and how she opened up her home. She desired to serve the body of Christ through her abundance. And what if we, again, could have that same mentality? Live a mentality of having an open hand to serve wherever the Lord may lead us. It is said more than once by the apostles that her character and her heart to serve were acknowledged. I mentioned one with Paul when he was likely referring to Lydia in Romans 12, 11. And now listen to Timothy, who we know was an accompanied with uh, Paul, Silas, and Lydia in Philippi. 1 Timothy 5, 10 says, Well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. Don't you want that said about you? Don't you want that to be what you are remembered for? For bringing up your children well, for opening your door, having an open door policy to offer hospitality, for having a heart to serve God and to serve his people, and for being devoted to kindness and good deeds. Ladies, I don't know if there is a better legacy you can try to live up to. This description of Lydia sets a whole new standard for us. As women of God, we are called to emulate these same characteristics. Lydia truly is a beautiful example of women who used her gifts, talents, and the person God made her to be to fulfill the calling that he placed on her life. Lydia the Aster may have been a late bloomer, but she was not, she wasted no time about being about the father's business. She became a beacon of hope and a star in the community pointing others to Christ. She was a woman with a calling. She called out to the Lord and he answered and he placed a calling on her life and she responded and fulfilled it. Lydia fulfilled the calling of her life by being a hope seeker, by seeking out truth, seeking out the Lord. She was a hard worker. She fended for her family and that was evident in what she had under her, her home, how she had servants and how she was a dyer, how she worked for what she had and she was a hospitable woman. I pray that these descriptions will one day be a banner that I am able to wear. May we take this amazing example of Lydia and be willing to readily bloom wherever the Lord has us in whatever season of life we might be in. Old or young, single or married, the Lord has a plan and a purpose for you if you only yield to him and allow him to direct your steps. May we not be deterred by our past or the years behind us and cling to the hope and the dreams of tomorrow knowing that God's not done yet. God's not done with you and he's not done with me. He only wants you to yield to him and allow him to direct your steps so that he can impact those around you by you and through you. Every one of us has a microphone. Every one of us has a level of influence. If there is a mother in your life, which there has to be some kind of form of mom, you're here, right? If there's a sister, if there's a friend, if there's a coworker, There are people around you who you influence. How are you influencing them? Are you like Lydia? Or are you turning others away from the Lord through your example? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you and we just, we praise you and thank you for this time that you've given us. We praise you and thank you for the example of Lydia that you put in your word. It brings us hope It encourages us, knowing, God, that you can use anyone, anyone with a willing heart. Lord, we pray that you would direct our steps. Lord, that you would help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear 
those around us who are hurting and need you. Help us to see and minister to those God-sized holes in their life, that they need you, God. May we be a salve and pour out into their lives, showing them and directing them back to you. We pray for opportunities, God. We pray that you would open our eyes again to see those opportunities and that we wouldn't fear walking through it, Lord. We pray, God, that you would just continue to embolden us as women of God. May we recognize and see that we are your child. May we see that you have a purpose and a plan, a future and a hope for each and every individual woman in this place. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.